You're listening to K-Talk Radio, KBJA 1640 AM, Sandy, Salt Lake City, and all across the Wasatch Front, bringing you live, local, two-way talk. From townhall.com, I'm Ron DeRoxter. State of emergency in Florida today ahead of a potential threat from what is now Tropical Storm Elsa. The impacts from the storm, whether it's a strong tropical storm or a weak hurricane, uh, will begin affecting the Florida Keys and portions of the South Florida Peninsula as early as Monday. That's Governor Ron DeSantis. The threat is of concern to rescue operations at that partially collapsed condo in Surfside near Miami. Meanwhile, the death toll has been raised to 24, at least 126 people still missing. In the aftermath of last year's death of George Floyd, a coalition of Minnesota's largest law enforcement groups sued the state to overturn a state law changing the standard for justified use of deadly force by police. The lawsuit claims the law, which took effect in March, violates officers' rights to self-defense and unconstitutionally compels officers to forfeit their rights to refuse to testify against themselves in deadly force cases. The Supreme Court's agreed to hear a challenge to Maine's law that excludes religious schools from a state tuition assistance program. The case is one of 10 the court added to its docket as it wrapped up its nine-month term Friday. At issue is a Maine tuition assistance program meant to help students who don't live near a public school. The state prohibits the use of the assistance for students to attend a religious school, although it may be used to attend other private schools. The state says it's a simple case of church-state separation. An attorney for families challenging the ban says singling out religious schools for exclusion violates the U.S. Constitution. Bob Agner reporting. If you have back pain, shoulder, neck, hip, knee, or foot pain from exercise or even just getting older, you must order the three-week quick start now. Discount it to only nineteen ninety-five to see if it will work for you. I think it could. Give your body what it needs to heal itself. Go to relieffactor.com, call 800-500-8384, relieffactor.com. At Bells, customers get all sorts of perks, like Style Circle Rewards, which give cardholders double points every day on every purchase, or Club 40 and Fabulous, where everyone 40 and up gets an extra 20% off on Tuesdays, even on our best spot-on values. Fresh styles, big savings, and fun perks every day. Bells, little things mean everything. Bells is part of our Sage family. Offer exclusion supply. Glory to the newborn king. It's Saturday. 3 o'clock, I'm Steve Reinhardt. I am your host. You're with K-Talk, AM 1640, the voice of Utah. K-Talk is now in its 56th year on the air, and that makes it the third oldest continually broadcasting radio station in the entire United States of America. It is 102 degrees outside right now. Be careful out there. Remember, fireworks are illegal tonight and tomorrow in most cities around the state of Utah because of the ongoing drought. You may wonder why we led with bumper music a moment ago that is Christmas music. And the reason is, is it's uh, (laughs) to create the atmosphere for our guest. We have a special guest who will be coming on, who's with the Princeton Theological Seminary, who will be joining us in just a moment. I'll introduce him further in just a second. wanted to get past a couple of other preliminary introductory items before we go to that interview. If you've been listening to our show, or my show, for a long time, you know that we often cover topics of historical significance, cultural significance. We cover periodically religion. We like doing current events. And you probably also know, having listened to me for a while, that I'm an attorney by trade. Makes many of you not like me, I'm sure, but I'm actually a patent attorney. So let me know if you invent anything. I often find myself involved in lawsuits involving patents and trademarks and needing to use expert witnesses. And in a way, I view many of the guests who come on this show as being expert witnesses. They often have expertise and knowledge that it would be difficult for any of our listeners to ever acquire, no matter how much time they spent studying a particular subject, unless you devoted your life to it. And one of the reasons that we cover current events and historical topics so much more than we do religion is because it's difficult to get into religion, and it's difficult to find someone who is unbiased. Particularly here in Utah, where we have many people who are in the working class, there's a distrust, perhaps, of academia. (laughs) On my part, there is, perhaps to some extent. And there is deep interest here in the state of Utah in religion. There's deep interest in the New Testament. There's deep interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls. As a matter of fact, there was a Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit that rolled through here a few years ago at the Leonardo, the museum downtown that I went to. They gave a lecture in the auditorium next to that. And despite that interest, there are 
many things going on in the world of biblical archaeology and New Testament research that people are not aware of. There are archaeological finds out there of real significance to the New Testament. Some people have a very superficial knowledge of them, and other people are not aware of them. For instance, Oxyrhynchus, the garbage dump in the first century. Manuscripts were just discarded there. They've been unearthed. And so I wanted to explore some of those questions, and I didn't know who to turn to. And so I asked our guest, who's holding on the guest line, Professor James Charlesworth, to come with us on the air and help us understand some of these things better. And he has been so kind and so gracious to agree to do that without having any kind of pre-existing relationship with either me or the station. And so I'm so grateful to have him here. I want to introduce him before I bring him onto the line and tell you just a little bit about it. Professor Charlesworth uh, is with the Princeton Theological Seminary in New Jersey. He's Methodist, and he has several degrees, as you might imagine. He's got a Bachelor of Arts degree from Ohio, Westland University. He's got a Ph.D. from Duke and is a professor there at the Princeton Theological Seminary, a place where most of us here in the geographic area that's somewhat far flung from New Jersey <laughs> will never step foot in a classroom. And, Professor, I'm going to try to bring you on now. Professor Charlesworth, can you hear me okay? I hear you clearly now. Well, I hope you could hear the intro as you were on hold there. Yes, I did. It was like you were in a Qumran cave down the lowest part of the earth. <laughs> well, you would know having you been there. It's an experience yes. most of our listeners will never have. It is such an honor and a privilege for us to have you on the air. And as I mentioned in my intro, we don't know each other or have any kind of pre-existing relationship, and yet you've agreed to come on the air and even to take some live callers. And I appreciate it very much. So thank you for being here. Well, it's very important for scholars to stay in touch and communicate with everybody that's interested, from the atheists to the agnostics to the fundamentalists in Judaism and Christianity, because what we are hearing from the uh, unlearned is very distressing. Actually, the less you know, the more we're hearing from people. There were many people I could have turned to and asked to come on the air. And not all of them rubbed me in the right way. Just just based on what I was seeing them publish, what I, the YouTube videos that I see, I came to much the same conclusion as yourself. And so who do we trust when it comes to these issues of the New Testament and the Bible? I think there are many people you can trust, but I think people are highly intelligent. They know when someone is screaming, they may be falling underneath a collapsed hypothesis, and we don't know, there is no one that knows everything and can answer all the questions, but most of us that have spent 60 years or more devoted to reading and studying 12 or more languages and, in, and digging and exploring and studying and editing, uh, we get a lot better in answering questions because we've learned to understand uh, what the possible answers could be. Can you tell us about yourself and how you became interested in this topic? In one word or less? <laughs> in 1954, I was 14 years old, and the Dead Sea Scrolls became sensational. Everybody was reading them and running around, and I decided I was going to find out what this is all about. My father was Reverend Dr. Charlesworth, and his father was Reverend Dr. Charlesworth, and so I lived in a family where they had a lot of answers, but I didn't. So I decided to follow Jesus and find out what are the possible answers. Um, I went to college, and then I was invited to Duke by a man that just came back from Vatican II, and maybe I impressed him because he says, we're not going to let you leave until you accept our highest award. So I went to Duke, and then I applied to the doctoral program and was accepted, and I earned the Ph.D., received Phi Beta Kappa, was given a Fulbright to Edinburgh, and then Clarendon published my dissertation. And then I went to study with DeVoe in Jerusalem, Roland DeVoe, was the excavator of Qumran and the first editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
which have literally revolutionized our understanding of the Judaism of the time of Jesus, Jesus' life, and the emergence of something that you and I would say it's Christianity. Christianity was a Jewish movement for decades. You did your studies in a Methodist faith. I don't know if you noticed, but I let in with Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Not written by John yes. Wesley, but his younger brother, Charles Wesley. <laughs> it's not Christmas, yes. but I did that in tribute to Charles Wesley. Well, never forget that John Wesley was very influential on Joseph Smith. And uh, I know a little bit more than that, but I don't want to share it because I'm not supposed to know it. And uh, uh but I've often you're, you're welcome said to share that, any thoughts that you'd like. You, there, there's nothing. Well, that's, that's well often. I've often been quoted as saying, when I'm around Mormons, I often feel the spirit of God moving in our midst, and I feel that same way with many Jews. Uh, the the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown how Jewish Christianity was originally, and how Judaism uh, changed so much from the first century. So obviously Christianity and Judaism had a similar mother, but they went in different directions. And what I'm trying to do is point that we do have the same God, the same moral code, and the same hope. Well, I appreciate those thoughts very much. And those are nice, gracious words to say to our listeners, many of whom share the predominant faith here in the state of Utah, as, as do I. And many of them have a very deep, abiding faith in the New Testament, and they're very curious about what they might learn from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And yet, there, there's such complexity there, and such a divergence of opinion, that it's hard for them to know what to take away from those finds, even when they go and see fragments of papyri at museums around town as they come and go. And I wanted to try to ask you some of the questions that I think might be of interest to them, recognizing that we could go on for days. The origins of the New Testament, or at least when the Gospels were written. You know, of course, Mark was first, I think, is the predominant view. If 7Q5 in the Cave 7 in the Dead Sea Scrolls, if that is from the New Testament, that would be, mean that Mark was, was 50 AD or sooner. What is the terminus post-chem date and, and terminus ante-chem date for the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of uh, leather... Uh, documents, papyrus documents. Uh, there are some etchings on uh, uh, on clay pots. Uh, they date earliest around 300 B.C. They were put in caves about 67 when the Roman soldiers came and destroyed the area. And many of the scrolls were taken to Jerusalem and went up in flames. Uh, we know some of them were taken to Masada, and that was destroyed in 74. What we do have is a terminus ad quem. The Dead Sea Scrolls really uh, date before, at the absolute latest, 74, uh, and they go back. But this is quite, go back centuries, this is quite a long period. Now, one thing I would emphasize is that we have about 100, I would say even more, because I know about many Dead Sea Scrolls that are not in the hands of scholars. So we have let's say, a thousand documents, and we have every book in the Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament, uh, with the possible exception of Esther, and now we found a commentary on Esther at Qumran, so they probably had Esther. But once we've said that, Steve, remember, there are basketfuls of unidentified fragments. Now, yes. let me help you understand, when we refer to a fragment, some of the fragments I have published are 100 little fragments of a fragment that we call fra a fragment, like the New Jerusalem text or, 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 or some other thing, Barki Nafshi. Uh, there are a lot of volumes that I have going to press, three volumes now, that go to Westminster John Knox Press for the Princeton Dead Sea Scroll Project. And we hope within about three years we will finish all this work and then put out the uh, uh, English version of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And why are the scrolls so fragmented? For instance, in some of the caves, they found only five or ten fragments. What happened to the rest of the scrolls? Were they were just taken away, or were they looted, in your opinion? Stephen, you're asking a wonderful question. I will give you my answer. The cave one, obviously, that's the first cave found, and then they're up to 11 caves, and it's in the order of 
being found. Only Cave 3 was found by my teacher, Roland DeVoe, which means Cave 1 was found by the Bedouin. And I spent a lot of time with the Bedouin in the 60s and 70s. And uh, they said that when they found them, they were looking for gold and silver and priceless. And they took these scrolls. Now, one of the scrolls is worth $25 million. So you can get an idea that scrolls today are now very valuable. What they were doing, they were throwing them in the air looking for, uh, looking for something that wasn't a leather scroll. And I said, what did you do with some of them? Ah, oh, we hang them in our tents. I said, what did you do with some of them? Well, we repaired our sandals. So you know why I was looking for where the Bedouin, these are wandering shepherds in the desert where they would put uh, put their sandals when they're finished. It makes me um, cringe. I just hate even thinking about this. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing is uh, they, they were found by people that deliberately destroyed them, thinking they were worthless. They referred to as smelly uh, leather fragments. And uh, then the second thing is, what would you look like 2,000 years after someone put you in a cave? So you have the... Uh, element of time and decay and uh, some of the scrolls i've worked with you can see where worm went through obviously the romans when they the romans uh the jews revolted against the romans in 66 first century and uh, in 70 jerusalem went up in flames i don't know if there's anybody they can give you an idea of how many scrolls uh, were in jerusalem how many scrolls were in the 30 or more synagogues, how many were in uh, Christian homes? And what happened to them? Well, obviously, they were all burned uh, when the Jerusalem went up in flames, except uh, uh, before that, just a few months before, Titus, who's on his way to becoming Roman emperor, uh, said, if you come out peacefully and if you're not involved in the war, you can come out. So that's why I think some Christians came out carrying a copy of the Gospel of John, which is hidden beneath the Greek copy that we now have. Do you agree that Mark was the earliest Gospel? The earliest portions are in John, but the earliest copy, earliest Gospel is Mark. Now, we can't date it. Uh, the consensus is some not, sometime between 69 and 71. All specialists on Mark would agree. Uh, which makes it kind of impossible to find a copy of Mark in a cave that no one has been in since 67 until it was excavated, which would be, uh, you know, 1955. And what about 7Q5, Cave 7? Do you agree with Jose O'Callaghan's conclusions? In the, I guess it's now been 30 No years. one does. Uh, our work on the Greek fragment is by the two great papyrologists, Eldon J. Epp, who taught at Harvard, and Larry Hutardo, who taught at Edinburgh. And they have worked through all the Greek fragments from K7, and we are about to send those to our publisher, which is John Knox's uh, uh, publisher. When I look at it, the only word that is evident is chi, and that means and. The rest of it is a very mutilated papyrus, and... Uh, the ones that I, tr we had a big conference in uh, Salzburg, Austria, on these fragments, 7Q5. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said it cannot be Mark because, well, I said it's improbable that it's Mark. I said it could be a copy of Mark that's different our, than our copy of Mark, but it's not similar to any copy of Mark that we know about. But then that's still possible because it would be the earliest copy of Mark. And we know that Mark is taking shape throughout the first century. Obviously, you know that scribes, if you copy a letter inadvertently, you uh, are not going to copy it perfectly. You may change a semicolon to a period, and then someone say you forgot to capitalize. And the whole process of copying uh, means you're letting errors come in. But we also have additions, intentional additions, to make things clarified. So I don't think it's Mark. But I did say at this conference, I would not be surprised if it didn't turn out to be something uh, like the Jewish writings we have 
in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, and subsequently Puesh has tried to show, I think rather successfully, that this is uh, these these fragments from Cave Seven. Uh, some of them belong to the Book of Enoch, which we already know was making its way into Greek. You your readers will know that in Jude, uh, Enoch is quoted, so it was already considered among the followers of Jesus as a very important uh, witness from God. And so you don't find compelling the other theories about 7Q5, for instance, that there's part of the word Genesaret there, or that maybe there was a misspelling where this alveol or consonant D was substituted for T. Is any of that worth it? We had a big conference at Duke when I was a professor at Duke. There wasn't a professor at Duke that agreed that it was Mark, and there wasn't a professor subsequently in the world that really agreed with it. More and more people were saying uh, it, 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 is, it looks like it's a literary text, because I'm looking at the hand now, it's a literary hand. Remem- mm-hmm. Remember, many of these Greek uh, documents are letters or, or uh, correspondence about business, but this is from a literary document, but it's not Mark, not in my opinion. We have a caller who has a question for you. Do you mind taking the live caller? Oh, of course not. Caller, you're on the air. We may have lost them. I think we put them on hold and they hung up. I apologize. I, we'll go back to them in a moment. Well, what about... Well, if he's listening or she's listening or whoever it was, I assume it's a male or a female, they'll call back and I'll be happy to try to answer the questions. We have a call screener. We'll get them back on in just a moment. Tell us about Oxyrhynchus. It's an archaeological site that I think is of enormous historical significance, and nobody knows anything about it. Would you say that it's... Well, I've been there, and I I was driving around trying to find uh, uh, anything that uh, would help us. It's really... What we have are fragments, invaluable fragments, found uh, in really uh, garbage heaps. It's miraculous that anything survived, and uh, it's exceedingly important because it preserves some of our earliest copies of New Testament writings and other writings. Remember, Christianity was trying to survive in a very hostile environment. So uh, Christians were being fed to uh, uh, lions and uh, put in gladiator contests, and, you know, Nero lit them uh, to bring light to uh, Rome. He had burned Rome, Nero did, in the 60s, late 60s, and he blamed it on the Christians, and uh, he covered them with oil, and obviously this is horrific. So the early Christians that are behind your faith and my faith suffered greatly, and uh, we can't think that they're sitting there copying scrolls and studying as scholars, uh, it's it's a very difficult time until about 325 when Constantine it, says, it, let's it, have it, counsel. Let me yes. just ask you, so it, it's Tacitus who talked about the Christians being burned as lamps by Nero. Is he reliable, yes, yes. in your opinion? Is his testimony on that reliable? I, I, I don't know that the uh, uh, gifted scholars and the erudite professors uh, would would say he's always accurate, But he seems to be a reliable witness. What about his contemporaries like Josephus? You're an expert on Josephus. Do you think Josephus' references, the testimonium, Well, I've written a lot on that. We have also found an Arabic copy of Josephus, and it doesn't have what was alleged to be the Christian editions. So we have in Josephus in the first century, he makes a reference to Jesus, And we know that is certain because later he refers to John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, which means he wouldn't identify John the Baptist by someone he hadn't mentioned. So we go back and see what he's saying, uh, and a lot of the statements he makes a Christian would not have made, but also some statements only a Christian would make. So we have argued that what we have is the Testimonium Flavianum, which is Josephus's reference to Jesus has been yes. tampered with and expanded by a Christian. And lo and behold, we find a, a, an Arabic text 
and what we consider the Christian editions are noticeably absent. So, yes, uh, but what is very interesting, why would Josephus mention Jesus? He, he tends out to be much more important than most scholars admit. Most scholars say, well, he led a movement which was a failure. He was crucified, and uh, they ran in all directions. Well, they didn't run in all directions. They claimed, and that is a fact, they claimed that in their lost and lonely life, Jesus appeared to them, and they resisted it. Everyone resisted it. Finally, they said, he appeared to me, and they went on in uh, various parts of the world, uh, the record is that Thomas made his way to India, uh, and you have Paul and Peter made their way to the center of the known world, which is Rome. And they all continued the witness. Not one of them said, ah, we made it up, we we, we just were having fun, but we didn't want to pay it with a life. Uh, they paid it with their life, and even the tradition is, I can't say I didn't have a tape recorder, but Peter supposedly says, no, I'm not worthy of being crucified the way Jesus was. Crucify me upside down. What we have right. everywhere is rumor or record and evidence that the followers of Jesus remain faithful to their conviction. And uh, uh, the big witness would be Paul, because he hates these Jews that believe Jesus was the Messiah, and he's going to throw them into prison. And on his way to Damascus... He has this experience, and he never wavers from his conviction that Jesus appeared to him and commissioned him. And I will tell you one thing, Stephen, if you have an experience in which you absolutely know it's Jesus and you're seeing him, uh, you will never be able to deny that. There are 27 books in the New Testament. How many are written by Paul? 13? I guess Hebrews is disputed. What would you? Uh, so, uh, several of them are. Just, so we only know there are seven about for sure. seven that are called the undisputed letters of Paul, and then some of them have been expanded. He was a genius, and uh, if you read him carefully, uh, you'll find times you get mad at him, and other times you think, "How did he know that?" So that's typical of a genius. But uh, I would say to you, how is it? that the Christian movement began with Jews who had such amazing abilities and such conviction. You know, to, today, how many Christians will say, go ahead and crucify me, I'm not going to change my faith, I know what I'm affirming. We tend to miss the point that being a Christian today in many, many places, not all now, it's getting worse, uh, you, you benefit from being a Christian. But... Uh, uh, when I was in the Near East lately, I had some Arabs tell me that seven little girls were crucified in Syria. Now, I'm not, I don't know that. I know that he said it, and I know he believed it. So I do know that Christians are being uh, persecuted, crucified, stoned because of their faith. And uh, we need to be strong and saying, even if they are wrong, they have a right to be wrong. And that's why our nation was founded, and we're having Independence Day tomorrow. And the ability to express our faith and to be heard and not ridiculed is a very important part of the founding of this country. I can't tell you how much I agree with the sentiments that you're sharing. I have some ability to read Latin. I don't have a degree in Latin, although I've thought about going back to school and trying to get one. My only interest in learning Latin is to read Origin, Justin Martyr, and some of Clement of Rome, and some of these others. And you're right; there is, there is something that we can learn today, much from from the sacrifices of these Christians. And I I certainly agree with you on on Independence Day. We have another caller who'd like to speak with you. Do you mind if I go to that caller now, Professor? Please do. Caller, you're on the air with Professor Charlesworth. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Professor. This is. Kelly, I wanted to call, and thank you for coming on. All of your thoughts are very interesting. I wanted to know, you have a scholar in many things, it sounds like. I wanted to know your idea on the fact that people question if Christ was married and the idea that Mary Magdalene could be his spouse. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I have a PowerPoint lecture 
where did Jesus meet Mary Magdalene? I uh, I have excavated in Migdal, which is on the western shores of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, I would say to you the one fact we know about Mary Magdalene that is most important is that uh, he was the first one to see Jesus after his resurrection. And I've thought, wait a minute, is that an accident, or did Jesus decide to appear first to Mary Magdalene? If so, what does it reveal about his relationship with her? And then she seems to disappear. Where is she in the Jerusalem community? Where has she gone? Uh, so Mary Magdalene, uh, is a, she was at the foot of the cross, and don't give her too much credit, they didn't crucify women, but there's another man there, the beloved disciple, and he's at the foot of the cross. Give him a lot of credit, but he may not have been old enough to be crucified. In any case, Mary Magdalene and Jesus' mother was at the foot of the cross, what relationship did Jesus have with his mother and with Mary Magdalene? And where is Jesus' father? Why did he disappear so early? There are recent discoveries, archaeological discoveries, Professor, including one just, just in the last 12 months that mentioned Jesus' wife. Do you, do you give credence to those finds? Well, let's not start as a Christian with all kinds of faith and declarations and confessions Let's start with Judaism. Uh, most men were married before 20, and uh, a lot of their wives died in childbirth. Now, Mary Magdalene did not die. We don't know anything. There are lots of rumors that she had a child from Jesus and that she fled to Spain. This is not accurate. These are not accurate reports. I'm not telling you that they're not true. Uh, but I, because I don't have that information, but I do know they're in spurious accounts, but then you can have spurious accounts of uh, Lincoln being shot. That doesn't mean he wasn't shot and killed. So you have to be very, very careful in this field. What do we know about Jesus? We're learning a tremendous amount. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been sensationally important. They have not mentioned Jesus because they couldn't. Uh, you know, it's just the, the, the scrolls that we're talking about were composed uh, and edited before 100 or before the time of Herod, which is 40 B.C. And you can't have a reference to someone that's uh, becoming a, uh, a preacher and uh, a powerful thinker uh, about 26. That's when Jesus comes on the scene and... Uh, leads multitudes and gives powerful lectures and uh, does all the things that we claim he does. Um, so you can't have a document written before 40 B.C. referring to a man that hasn't lived. So oh. don't expect references to Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thank you for the call. We appreciate it very much. Do you think the Essenes, they were certainly Jews, right? There are those who've tried to argue that they believed in some form of, of Christianity, I don't have the knowledge base to know if that might be true. What is your opinion on that, Professor Charles? Well, what you've got here is a confusion of different criteria. The Essenes, I have claimed, were the Einsteins of antiquity. Many of them were the sons of Aaron, which goes all the way back to Moses and the first priest, Aaron. So they are very brilliant. Uh, I can tell you in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the authors knew that the moon got its light from the sun, and they knew that the heart pumped the blood through the body. Um, how many other things did they know but were lost in the fragments? And uh, these are very brilliant people. They're influenced by Persian thought, but no evidence at all of their influence from Greek thought, and that is probably intentional. But boy, they're they are gifted. They're writers. That's, people forget that. These are writers. Now, in terms of Christianity, uh, I have no doubt that when some of the Essenes fled to Jerusalem, and they were there from about 66, well, there some of them had been there earlier, and uh, we know that they are living within a few feet of where the followers of Jesus reside, where he had the Last Supper. And there's evidence he may have asked Essenes to use the room. 
uh, that he was familiar with for the Last Supper. Now, when Qumran is destroyed, uh, a lot of the Essenes are going to lose their faith, faith. But their faith is very similar to many of the beliefs that the followers of Jesus had. Uh, that is apocalyptic, which means God has revealed another world, a world above, has promised a better life, uh, and has promised sending the Messiah. So if many of the Essenes believed in uh, the kingdom of God coming soon and a Messiah, then with the loss of their community and the destruction of their community, I would think a few, some of my colleagues would say hundreds, have become uh, followers of Jesus. Do you think the Gnostic Gospels have truth in them? What is your opinion on the Gnostic Gospels? Well, the Gospel of Thomas is unique among all the... Go I taught Coptic for years here at Princeton and also at Duke, and, and, uh, and, and you're an expert I, I did expert. a lot of work on these. Uh, you ta if you read the Gospel of Thomas, which is a list of sayings of Jesus, some of them are preserved more perfectly than in the New Testament, which is very, very interesting. But I haven't got time to go into that. We would lose everybody. Uh, <laughs> but the Gospel of Truth is also beautiful. The Gospel of tr Truth is a joy to them that know it. Uh, that's good stuff, you know? The gospel of truth is a joy to those who know it. You would agree, Mormons would agree, Methodists would agree, Roman Catholics would agree, and Jews, most all Jews would agree. Uh, the gospel of truth is a joy to those who know it. I, I would hope that we get more focus upon the joy of our faith and less time trying to defend it. Going back to the subject of Oxyrhynchus, how many volumes have been published of the of the manuscripts? Found eighty <laughs> six, and how many more have to be published? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I... Oh, uh, it's a uh, it's a vast collection, and you could lose your whole life just going in there. And the early scholars that worked on it were so dedicated and have served us so well. Uh, but also, I would ask, what other documents didn't make it? Uh, the, these are exceptions. Well, and I, one time I was in I was in Cairo, and I saw five thousand um, papyri that no one knew about. I bought quite a few of them in those days. You could do that. And lo and behold, Steve, don't be too mad at me. I don't know. I when I moved from Duke here, I misplaced them. I don't know. I keep looking. Where are they? Uh, but if only you could find those. What value they, will, they uh, might have. Well, uh, yes, and what do they contain? And remember, I went through thousands and chose the ones that I thought were oldest and most important. I'm embarrassed to say that I I don't know where they are. They're, are they here in my... Well, I have about 20,000 books. Are they hidden in the book somewhere? Are they hidden in a file somewhere? I think you understand that a professor has to teach classes, has to direct, doctor, direct doctoral students, has to go to conferences, has to dig. And often people say, well, you know, it wouldn't take you but about eight hours to find those. Why don't you just stop and find them? You know, I just don't have eight hours to stop and go look for them. And where would I look? I don't, don't think that I haven't looked. You know, I still think every now and then, ah, I didn't look there yet. Well, I think about all my files and filing cabinets full and full. I went through, I had a file called papyri. It's not in there. And I have books on papyri. They're not in there. I think one day it may have been taken from, I, I left a lot of things in the basement of the old library at Princeton, and they all disappeared. And I thought if they were in those files, uh, they're gone. Well, it causes me to wonder about broader questions, about other, other items that may be missing. Well, only a fraction of the papyri from Oxyrhynchus were excavated that are there. What, maybe 10% or 5%? There's still so much in the ground. Will it ever be excavated in your Well, that's why I went there. I looked, if I could just find one, find one little piece. We're talking about dung heaps, and it's, and it's very dangerous because now you get it in your nose and you'll die. So you have to be very careful, uh, even walking. And I, I, I found lots of dung heaps where the donkeys and the camels relieve themselves. Well, you don't want to start digging through that, but that's 
what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, these papyri were found in, in garbage pits. Is it possible there'll be future excavations that find the, the remains? Well, Steve, I would say one of the very sad things, in the 20s and 30s, there were very wealthy men that were funding everything, and Rockefeller funded the work on the Dead Sea Scrolls and then stopped funding it. No one is funding this work anymore. In if fact, only we uh, could change you know, that. I mean, they're, they're funding such ridiculous causes, many of these billionaires. Why are they not funding this type of thing, which which is, of, I would say, macro-historical? Uh, Steve, I would say the answer is very simple. The education that was being taught in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s uh, was vanishing, vanished from uh, the world. People got interested in computers. They were interested in making money. Uh, and that's not uh, what we do in this field. We ask questions, and uh, we're exploring. When you ask questions, you'll never get a definitive answer. If you start with a definitive answer, it's axiomatic. You're absolutely uh, perfectly right. But that's because you... And what it took, uh, took the Middle Ages to help us to realize that we have to start with questioning and exploring, not with... This is what I know, and I'll prove it to you. You can prove any postulate you want. Because we only have about 10 minutes left, I'd like to ask you some rapid-fire questions, which I know will be of interest to our listeners. Are there passages in the King James Version, the 1611 Version, that were probably missing from the original New Testament? For instance, John 5-7, or the Paracope Adultery. What is your opinion on that? Would you well, John 7:53 to 8-11 is in addition to John, and we know uh, it appears sometime in the late second century. It was not part of the original uh, version of John, and now in the new translations, it's sometimes put at the end of John or in a footnote. Uh, it is a later edition. Uh, there's no question about that, but even it may be one of the most historically accurate parts of John. Uh, I think my own opinion is that it came from Papias collections, and I've been spending 30 years trying to find Papias's work, and I found it in a 13th century uh, manuscript in a monastery, but I didn't have time to follow up on that. So it's still out there. You think it could still be found? Somebody, ha somebody yes. has it. Yes. If only it could be found. I well, you're talking about millions of dollars uh, studying manuscripts that are palimpsest. In St. Catherine's Monastery... There are, there is a palimpsest, which means you have six. You have all right. You can't go down to Seven Eleven and buy a uh, a piece of paper and write write on it. What you do is in the old days. Let's talk about the fourth, fifth, tenth century, up until those. You scraped uh, what had been written and you write above it. For example, in Saint Catherine's Monastery, I've been working on the oldest copy of the Syriac New Testament, and uh, be, uh, you, it is. It is a belief, the black copy of the lives of the female saints. So you have a layer under a layer, and the early layer is the most precious copy of the uh, Vetus Sura, the old Syriac Gospels. Is there still hope? So that would be a way of doing, finding the palimpsest and trying to find out what is beneath. And are there still undiscovered finds in the basements of these monasteries and these cathedrals? Or, or has everything been gone through to a large extent? Are you optimistic that some of these seminal works will still be uncovered? I, I am. I am. What about the... Uh, what is the original New well, Testament? Remember, John evolved, and I said to you earlier that the earliest person portions of the New Testament may be in John, the what we call the sign source. It may even be earlier than the Q source, uh, which is used by Matthew and Luke. So you have maybe the sign source in the 30s or early 40s. Then you have a source used by Matthew and Luke about the same time. And then you have the writing of Mark in the late, uh, let's say sometime in the late 60s, or between 69 and 71, somewhere in there. I'm trying to share with you what the leading scholars are saying, uh, not what I'm thinking of. I'm trying not to say what I personally think, but I do agree with those statements, by the way. And we would welcome your personal opinion as well. Were the Gnostic Gospels, is it possible that, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas was the Q source or an early version of it? 
there is some relationship, but it is not the Q stores, which is very interesting. Uh, maybe Q disappeared because Matthew and Luke preserved it, and work. We know so little about Q. It just begins with the question: How is it possible that Matthew and Luke are so similar? Aha! It's because they use Mark. Oh, what about other passages which are sayings of Jesus where Matthew and Luke are so similar? And that's what we call the Q source. Could it be found potentially in Oxyrhynchus or in the fragments that that still... No one would say that uh, we're not going to find it. Uh, We are exploring and wondering and collecting. Uh, Just think about the Nakamati Codices and Oxyrhynchus. What documents they brought to us that we didn't know anything about. Of the great unical codices, which do you think is the oldest? Vaticanus? Probably. And it, yeah, but Sinaiticus is not far behind. I see. The subjects that we're just glossing over on this phone call, I realize you could devote a lifetime to. If I had ten lives to live, I would spend a couple of them studying, as you have, the New Testament. And and these old languages, and I find it to be so fascinating, as as do many of the people that I associate with and many of the people that I know. We only have about four minutes left in the program, but in those four minutes, what do you think is most important for our listeners to understand, or what sources could they turn to that you think would be most beneficial for them in understanding these subjects as lay people? Well, they need to start with their own questions. What are their questions? Who was Jesus? Why did he... At the world of fire, why was he crucified? Did he know any of the Essenes? Did he debate with them? The answer is probably yes. Some of his sayings don't make any sense until you study some passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, why did the Church decide to have a very limited number of books in the New Testament and in the Old Testament? And uh, others are so important. I call them uh, Sacra Scriptura, the sacred scriptures. On the fringes of the Bible are many writings that are very important. Why did the early followers say this is the canon? I, I know you have to have a canon, but the canon is not exclusive. It points to more inclusiveness. So many of the Jewish writings that are not in the canon are exceedingly important for understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament writings. What are the extra-canonical scriptures which you would say are most important, top six? Well, the Book of Enoch is the most important, but the Book of Enoch can, it consists of at least six, is five books, five or six books, and they were written, oh, from about, oh, 230 down to, let's say, the time of Herod. And uh, they are exceedingly brilliant, And uh, they are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, little fragments. And uh, uh, we're uh, in Cave 7. Many of us are thinking we have portions of the Book of Enoch. And it's only extant fully in Ethiopic, but it's so different uh, so that you're not going to— The earliest copy of Enoch in Ethiopic is 14th century, but we have it earlier in Latin and Greek, but only little portions— and then we have the Aramaic fragments at Qumran. So it's it's very frustrating to realize we're getting insight into the evolution of the book of books of Enoch, uh, but they're so fragmentary. What would be your thirty second opinion of origin? Brilliant mind, fabulous Christian, wonderful human being. Are you surprised he hasn't been beatified by the Catholic? Yes, Church? I am. Yeah. And who would be the other early Christian fathers or writers who you would think would be the most significant, most important? Justin Martyr? Well, Papias? Cassian. Cassian would be very powerful. Uh, He was the first one to uh, give us the four Gospels in one and um, a composite of the four Gospels, but he also has access to other Gospels that we don't know about, and maybe the Gospel of Peter and uh, the Gospel of Thomas, but uh, he he would be important. Ignatius of Antioch, the early writer, a brilliant mind, martyr, 
follower of Paul, influenced uh, the world in a deep way. And these are these are considered considered sacred men. And I interrupted you earlier in the program when you were about to mention Constantine. Is is his importance to Christianity overemphasized? I know well, he, you know, you get into Constantine. How how much of it is reliable? And uh, people say he organized the Council of Nicaea. He didn't. He called uh, the great scholars together, but he didn't call one Jew. So what has happened? Jesus was a Jew. All the authors of the New Testament, it seems, or almost all, were Jews. In 325, you have a council and no Jew is invited. I may be one of the few people that have pointed that out. Uh, What's going on? And uh, to what extent is Christianity evolving away from Jesus in some ways? I would say that it has preserved, basically, uh, the Lord that we follow. Well, Professor Charlesworth, I... I wish we could go on longer than the allotted time that we have on this program. Your comments are, are so interesting, and I find the little that I know about your writing to be so uplifting. And to think that you've spent your, your career devoted to exploring these questions, I think is wonderful. And I, I can't tell you how gracious I think it is of you to come on the program without knowing what Well, it's expect. very important that we share the truth and the search for truth. That is what unites us. Our, our devotion to the one powerful God who created. And my gosh, when we learn astrophysically that we know so little about our universe. Something you studied. So let's just, yes. yeah, let's just keep in mind the wonder of our lives. Well, I'm going to put a link to some of your books on the station website, and I'll make sure that you get a copy of this program, and I'll be in touch with you uh, after the program ends. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing these thoughts for just a few minutes and particularly with how busy I know that you have to be out there and even as you've said you are it, it's very kind and I hope to have you back sometime in the future well we'll count on it Stephen and God be with you and all our listeners and you also Professor Charlesworth thank you thank you and, and have a wonderful 4th of July if we had more time we would have continued that interview it is the 4th of July and I wish everybody a happy Independence Day Please stay tuned for the next program. You're with K-Talk, AM 1640, the voice of Utah. I'm Steve Reinhart. I'll be back next week at 3 o'clock. I'm signing off. Representative Dan Crenshaw is calling for Gwen Berry to be removed from the U.S. Olympic team after the bronze medal winning hammer thrower expressed frustration and appeared to protest the national anthem when played while she was on the podium. The Texas Republican tied Berry's actions to critical race theory, which supposedly seeks to understand how racism and discrimination permeate various legal and societal systems. Well, first, let's talk about what CRT is, right? It's this, it's this idea that there's this sort of secret racism inherent in all of our institutions. Um, it's, a, it, 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 quote, it is defined as, as challenging the liberal order, um, the liberal definitions of equality and justice. Crenshaw says CRT favors some form of discrimination. Basically favoring some form of discrimination in order to correct for past discrimination. That's like that's the Ibrip Ibramek Kendi uh, quote. With McDonald's one, two, three dollar menu, you can choose among favorites like a delicious McChicken, 